Mark Amar, welcome to BCM with Friends, and thank you so much for being with us today. You've been in the industry a long time, 18 years now. You started off in financial services with Countrywide and Bank of America, and you're now in Brinks, which is a very different industry, something that many would see as a security company, but you make the valid point that it's more logistics, more like a DHL. You've been a member of the International Benchmarking Advisory Board of BC Management for almost four years now, and you've devoted a lot of your time to the Association of Continuity Planners. You've spoken at multiple international conferences, such as Continuity Insights, Disaster Recovery Journal, Spring and Fall World ACP National Leadership Conference. And of course, coming up now on March 18th, 2021, you speak at the Continuity and Resilience Core Global Conference, and we can't wait. You're the author of numerous industry-related articles, including pieces in the Journal of Business Continuity and Emergency Planning, Continuity Central, and LinkedIn. You call yourself an innovator in business continuity, and that certainly does come through in your articles, which are provocative and thought-provoking. In your article, The Secret to Executive Engagement, you say don't get executive engagement. And the point that you make is if you do the right things, the executives will automatically be engaged. Engagement should not be the goal. Instead, engagement should be the natural outcome. In your article, I admit I was wrong. You raise a very different perspective on the role of the risk assessment and business impact analysis in business continuity. Along with Dr. David Lindstedt, you co-authored the book, Adaptive Business Continuity, A New Approach. And you say that adaptive is a groundbreaking concept that has the potential to change the way business continuity is practiced globally. I certainly am extremely keen to hear some of your innovative, thought-provoking ideas. To start with, tell us how you ventured into business continuity and how's your journey been? Thank you, Dharaj. I am happy to be here and appreciate anybody who's listening in. Uh, so my journey in business continuity started unlike most people's journey in business continuity. Nobody tapped me on the shoulder. Nobody said, hey, Mark, we need somebody to do this business continuity stuff. There was actually an open position at my organization and I applied for it. That started over 18 years ago uh, and I've been in business continuity Ever since, uh, as far as the journey is concerned, it's, it's been great. Uh, lots of challenges, lots of opportunities, lots of fun along the way. I've met lots of interesting people as well. Um, what I would say is, is the first nine or 10 years, uh, my experience was being a dutiful, very by the book business continuity professional. And I would discover that a whole lot of the work that I was doing in the preparation and planning phase was not providing value when the time came to respond to an event or a disruption. Services or functions that we deemed were not critical suddenly became critical. Plans and strategies we developed when the sun was shining and the birds were chirping suddenly were not quite the same as they would be implemented when the skies were dark and the building was flooded and people, people were milling around wondering what to do. Um, and everything in between. People weren't using their plans. The plans were based on inaccurate assumptions. Sometimes we'd ad hoc or develop strategies on the fly and sometimes with a great deal of success. So what I started doing about halfway through that 18 year journey is, is really trying to chart, chart my own course. I spoke to a lot of colleagues that I respected within business continuity. Turned out a lot of them were, were doing the same thing. Um, they were kind of coloring outside the lines. They weren't strictly following the methodology or the life cycle of business continuity. And then when I, when I came across paths with Dr. David Lindstedt with Ohio State University, we decided, you know, maybe we need to create a framework that kind of stands alongside the traditional approach to business continuity, and it will give people within the discipline kind of the license to operate and color outside the lines. It'll, it'll give them license and the approval to say, you know what, I'm gonna do things differently. I don't have to subscribe to this very stringent methodology or life cycle. And, and I think a lot of people kind of like that and we're starting to see growth within the business continuity movement. What are the qualities that make a good BCM manager? I think there's really two qualities. Um, one is I think a willingness to learn. Um, I think if, if we think that 
once we get that recipe book for business continuity in terms of the life cycle or the methodology that our work is done, once we've kind of gotten certified or we understand that life cycle, then I don't think we're going to be very successful. We have to understand we're going to have to continually adapt. Uh, we're going to have to learn new innovative technologies. We're going to have to understand the changes that are taking place in the businesses and the organizations that we support in terms of just new innovative competitors in the marketplace, new innovative solutions to doing things, new business management processes. So we have to be open and willing to, to learn these new things. Um, and then the other, I think, important skill is communications. And, and it's, it's the, the full spectrum of communications. Too often we just think of communications being really good at email or really good at having a dialogue or a conversation. Um, but it's, it's all of those things. It's being able to, to write a broadcast email. It's being able to have a dialogue via chat or private message or email or some other means or some other channel, as well as being able to facilitate a group conversation, um, have difficult discussions with other people. And then the other part of that is just the active listening of communications. We so often think of communications as being how we broadcast or how we communicate to other people, how we communicate our opinions and our direct and directives and guidance. But 50% of that is how we receive that information. How good are we at interpreting what people are telling us they need in terms of empowering them, in terms of improving their prayer preparedness and improving their, their capability to be able to respond and recover effectively. It's, again, it's not, it's not simply knowing a methodology or knowing the details of how business continuity is executed. It's communications and it's that openness and willingness to learn. And that you might have to change that message depending on the audience, right? right? If it's a group of human resources people, you might have to change that message if it's versus a different a group of finance folks or a different a group of operations folks. And then you might even have to tweak it further for geographic locations, right? Yeah. We know different cultures exist in different countries and different regions around the world. So we as business country professionals have to be open to that and willing to change our message to accommodate other people and not the other way around. They don't have to change what they do just to accommodate us. So you did mention the magic word when you started off, you said you have to adapt. Tell us about adaptive business continuity. Sure, sure. Um, so it, there's a lot to digest in a, in a short period of time, but uh, let me first start by, by saying um, Adaptive is based on, on academic research. We, we try to pull a lot of empirical data and look at some of the research and what that tells us in terms of organizations that have experienced outages and disruptions and have fared relatively well as compared to organizations that have experienced those same disruptions and, and perhaps didn't do so well. And, and what the evidence tells us is it's not a plan. It's, it's not a BIA. It's, it's not the training and awareness they went through, or it's not even whether they had a business continuity program. Um, it's other factors. It's the capacity and the resources they had available. It's the level of competence within the organization, both at a, at a leadership and a decision-making level, as well as at the ground level. It's the, it's the empathy that leadership had. It's the trust and the authority they granted to people within the organization at ground level to be able to do what they need to do. Um, another benefit is it's outcome driven and not compliance driven. We want to look at the outcomes. Whenever a disruption occurs, are we seeing improved benefits in terms of reduced impact and reduced pain on behalf of the organization? And if so, then we need to keep doing what we're doing. If not, we might need to adjust and we might need to adapt. Um, and that leads me to the other piece, which is adaptive provides measures and tools to be able to objectively evaluate those outcomes, right? We can measure, we can measure the components of organizational pain. It's loss of customers, it's loss of revenue, it's lost productivity, it's lost, lost performance. Adaptive says, we need to consider not just the time, but the capacity, the functionality, the impact of the customers. And then through that, both measure the outcomes that we are producing, measure what steps we are taking to improve, and then measure what we've seen in the interim from this event to that event. Are we seeing an improvement in outcomes? And if so, how can we attribute that? And what can we do more of 
to further improve the next time we see those issues. So if I be extreme about it, can it almost be said that one doesn't need a planned, advanced, implemented, thought through business continuity management system or response? And literally, if you have the right characteristics, the right frame of mind, you can just do it without prior preparation. So we don't need a lot of this stuff that we are doing. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. I will say that I like to take the extreme position on this, in which case the answer to your question would be yes, right? We, if, if, if we focused only on capabilities, if we focused on improving resources, access to resources, the authority that people need to be able to mobilize and utilize those resources, as well as the competence within the organization, expand the diversity so we're making better decisions based on input and perspectives that are different from our own. Yes, we're gonna have much better outcomes than if our entire focus is on developing plans and how we go about developing those plans. Now, ideally, right, we, we wanna have maybe some procedures or we wanna have some strategies available to us but what I always say is having those strategies and those plans provide us absolutely nothing if we don't have the capabilities to best utilize okay. them. Yeah. But whereas if we look at the opposite, if we have the capabilities, but we don't have the plan, we're still going to be in a better position. Mm -hmm. If we have the plan without the capabilities, it buys us nothing. We spend a lot of time and a lot of effort developing those plans and those strategies only to find that they've failed us when, when we needed the most. Are you almost saying that therefore, what you need is overall resilience of the organization rather than maybe a planned BCMS. So it's more the functions coming together and supporting each other to, to do the right thing, whatever that may be. So that, that's a really good question. Uh, I kind of look at adaptive as maybe being that bridge where we evolve from this compliance driven, very life cycle driven approach to business continuity and preparedness to a more resilience focused approach to not just preparedness and business continuity, but the overarching ability of the organization to deal with a wide variety of outages and disruptions. We purposely kind of make a, create a narrow definition of adaptive, but I do 100% see our focus on capabilities and the components and attributes that contribute to those capabilities as being, as resilience as being kind of the next step or the evolution in that thinking. When I have done these podcasts and I talk to people, the general answer I've got is we all came together in the COVID-19. Has COVID-19 in some ways actually propelled us towards this working together, focusing on results as opposed to process? I think it has. So here's what I'll say is, is the lessons we've learned this past year dealing with a global pandemic has forced us to think differently about preparedness, business continuity, and resilience. But those lessons we learned um, in previous events, September 11th here in the U.S. and Hurricane Katrina here in the U.S., um, the, the, the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown in, of Fukushima in Japan, uh, the tsunami, I think, from 2005 that impacted Sri Lanka and India and, and other parts of the, the Southeast, Southeast Asia. The organizations impacted by those events really learned these same lessons. The problem is they were just in isolation and the overwhelming majority of organizations were still doing things the traditional way. Now, this past year in 2020, we're all seeing the same experience. We're all realizing, you know what, maybe all the time and effort we devoted to developing plans and doing BIAs and all this other stuff, we didn't really realize any benefit from. We need to think about this differently and we need to think about it in a different way. Here, here's a key part that I think it's important for us to understand is too often in business continuity, we think of preparedness and resilience only in one dimension. And that's within the organization. What's the organization's preparedness to an impact that it experiences? But so often, the event that impacts the organization impacts their community. It impacts their market and their industry. It impacts their suppliers. It impacts their customers and their consumers. So if their customers and consumers no longer have a demand for that product or are no longer able to consume that product or that service, we need to think differently about, okay, well, if those are impacted and not just us in isolation, how are we going to respond? And again, there's no easy solution. We can't simply develop a plan for how we're going to continue to run our airline business when travel has come 
to a screeching halt. We need to think differently and again, develop the capabilities to be able to respond more effectively when those events occur and when they affect not just us, but those different dimensions, our customers, our industry, our communities. You work in a very specialized industry. How does business continuity need to be evolved in such different specialized industries? What makes them tick from a BCM perspective? That's, that's a good question. Um, when we look at the industry that Brinks operates in, which is predominantly logistics, but also cash management, again, we, we can't think of it in isolation. Um, it, in order to get trucks on the road or to transport valuables and commodities, then we're dependent on airlines. We're dependent on uh, infrastructure to be able to transport stuff over the road or by rail or by ship or by any means necessary. So again, we, we need to develop not just the ability to continue delivering services when we're affected, but also when we see effects to our industry and our market, but also to those related markets and industries. It is a complex issue that we are tasked with with addressing and helping organizations to prepare for. And and again, trying to set the expectation that there's a plan that we can pull off a bookshelf or out of a SharePoint folder that's going to answer all those questions for us, I think sets us up for a little bit of disappointment. That's where the benefit lies is in thinking about it and not necessarily in jotting it all down for reference later because those things we jot down may not actually apply when we when we're dealing with that situation sometime in the future what can someone look forward to in a career in business continuity what makes a great thing for people to aspire to Ah. all right so what i will tell you is my experience in business continuity it's it's been overwhelmingly a good one and and i say that for for two reasons Um, First, I just get exposure to a lot of different people, right? So I get to work with all different parts of the organization, people at all levels in the organization. And I work with a lot of really cool people in facilities, in security, in operations, in finance, in human resources. I can't think of very many disciplines where I would get that level of exposure and get to get to work with that, that variety of people and, and backgrounds. And then the other cool thing that, that's really fun, and, and this is probably why I've stayed in it for 18 years, is no two days are the same. Because every day I wake up, there's a new challenge, there's something new to be addressed. And, and I kind of thrive in that environment. If this were the same thing every day, I would get very bored and I'd be willing, I, I, I would not have lasted, I probably wouldn't have lasted 18 months, let alone 18 years. So it's, it's just the fact that it, it is evolving. There's always new challenges, always new opportunities. Um, and, and I get to work with a great group of people in the execution of, of what I do in business continuity. Thanks very much. That's been very insightful, very fascinating. If someone did want to get understand more about adaptive business continuity, um, are there resources available? Where do they take a look at? Who do they talk to? Any thoughts that you can provide? Absolutely. So, so your single greatest resource is there is a website. It is adaptivebcp.org. From there, there's a section with articles um, and academic research. There's a section around videos, podcasts, and presentations. Uh, You can access the manifesto. There is also a list of what we call advisors. So there's a number of people who are operating in an adaptive fashion or running adaptive programs. You can get a list of their names and their contact information. And then the other thing I'll say is people are always welcome to reach out to me directly. Uh, My email is mnjarmor at gmail. Um, You can follow me on Twitter, bc underscore revolution. Um, And if you look me up on LinkedIn, you're sure to find me there. And again, always willing to talk on this, no no matter how long and no matter how many people. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. Lots of food for thought. As you said, every day we learn something new. So thanks once again and take care. Excellent. Thank you, Raj. My pleasure.